Well, good morning, Tipton Baptist. Uh, this is Jason coming at you from home on an icy Sunday, January 9th, 2022, uh, in lieu of our morning worship service because of the weather. Uh, it's On one hand, it's a shame that we can't meet because of the ice, but on the other hand, it's a beautiful thumbprint of God's own creation. When you see what in a very short period of time can happen so quickly with water being frozen, and if you look at it on the trees, it's beautiful, even though it's it's a little bit nerve-wracking because of power outages and driving and danger with traveling. But all that aside, it is beautiful. But it, while it's a shame we can't meet, it's wonderful that we can still have a moment and a, a devotional time in God's Word together uh, through this means. So I feel very privileged to be with you this way, if, if no other way. I hope you're able to watch uh, those of you who normally come. I hope you can can kind of tune in for just a few minutes as we go through a devotional. Uh, I'm going to look at a couple of verses in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, so turn there to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I'm going to pray and invite the Spirit of God to give us a moment of insight, and then we're going to have a devotional, and that's all. I don't have any pianist here. I have nothing I can lead in music with, so we'll just stick to a devotional, and that'll be all for today. So while you're turning to 2 Chronicles 7, let's pray. Father, thank you that we have your Word and that we can be in it on our own, and together, through this means, I thank you, Lord, that you have given us an opportunity, even though we're apart, to still find a way to be together and worship you through and in your word. And we ask that your spirit might give us a understanding of uh, prayer and our communal life with you in conversation with the Almighty as we come to you in prayer. Some of us come to you on a regular basis. Some of us probably maybe not so often. But Lord, might you cause a conviction due to our devotional today in your word this morning, cause a conviction in us to come to you daily, regularly, even every morning before we really get into our day. And then Lord, a conviction to further that, to be in, in communication with you throughout the days. Might we at Tipton be a, a people of prayer in 2022 in such a way that you enable us to be an influence that reflects Jesus all through our homes, households, all through our workplaces, all through our community, uh, because you set us a people who know you and are conversational with you every day. You set us in the lives of other people so that they might know you as well. Might we be that people? Uh, in part because of this devotional time this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So turn with me again to Second Chronicles. I just want to look at verse 13, 14, and 15 of chapter 7. So go to Second Chronicles 7, 13, 14, and 15. Guess what we read. Uh, the Lord's uh, appearing to Solomon as just a moment of background, and the Lord is speaking to King Solomon, the third king of the United Kingdom of Israel. The Lord said, When I shut up heaven, and there is no rain, nor command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. And God is speaking to Solomon about the temple that Solomon had spent time constructing. Uh, well, after David, of course, passed away, Solomon would be the one to build the temple. And God's talking with Solomon here, and Solomon's looking uh, for direction from God. So we see this idea here. And this idea in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 is an idea that I heard quite a bit as a student at Liberty University back in the 1990s when I was in my undergraduate program there. Uh, one of the co-founders of the school, uh, Jerry Falwell, uh, a very big influence in my life because not only he and Elmer Towns co-founding that university, but he regularly would come uh, at this point in his ministry and be a regular chapel speaker. And I got to hear him as well as the time I attended Thomas Road Baptist Church. One of the things Dr. Falwell said every year in a, a devotional somewhere in the fall of each year was nothing of eternal significance happens apart from prayer. Nothing of eternal significance happens apart from prayer. Now, people would argue and say, well, a lot of things happen apart from prayer, but not of eternal significance. And when he said that, he would constantly go back to the idea of things that we try to, uh, to do or to uh, accomplish without prayer and putting God in, in, in God's desires ahead of our own desire for accomplishment, without God's desires out in front for us to aim for and the goal that he would be seen as the hero 
and that he would be seen as the worker. He would be seen as the one who is the enabler of all good things to happen. That, therefore, he gets the credit. Anything that's done outside of that would cause us to be the hero or us to receive credit. And that has no eternal significance. That might have significance in this life here, on earth here, but it doesn't have significance as far as God forever getting praise that he deserves for his hand, providentially operating through his people in the world. So he said this, and I remember every year at a chapel, he would come back to say it, and he again would preach from this. And he said this largely uh, when he preached out of Second Chronicles chapter 7. He'd go to that verse 14, and again, I'll read verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now, for years, Dr. Falwell had a, his fingerprint in politics. But when he preached this, when I was under his uh, teaching in the 90s, he wasn't speaking of healing our land politically. He specifically was speaking of healing our land spiritually. Uh, a lot of people have taken it out of context, and they think that it'll cause the political situation to maybe sharpen up in one way or another that would favor one person's politics over another person's po politics. That's not what he was preaching. He was saying, spiritually speaking, that the, the hearts of people would begin to be touched by Christians who would pray humbly, seeking God's face, enabled to be the influence of Christ-likeness in the hearts of other people. That's what he preached about. And I remember that. It's resonated with me ever since, all these years. Dr. Falwell said, nothing of eternal significance happens apart from prayer to college students and to his parishioners for over 50 years at Thomas Road Baptist. And I don't believe this this sentiment is just of Falwell's. I believe it's a biblical truth that you can really draw from an Old Testament passage that carries practical applications and spiritual applications in our lives today, even here in Tipton, Pennsylvania. I think it's unique that we can take this quote from an old preacher uh, and turn it around and be uh, using it as perhaps uh, a, a line to remember in our own lives that might just spark and cause us to pray and put us back in Second Chronicles in a way, looking for some application. Look with me at verse 14 again. Uh, here it is behind me. And if you have your Bibles, let's look, with, look, at, look at it with me again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Um, God's people humbling themselves. God's people saying, God, we recognize we are not your son. We need your son's attributes in us to make a difference in the world, therefore gaining eternal significance for our actions for our entire lives. Where you get the credit, God, we need to be humble. Your son was humble. It takes me to Philippians chapter 2. When Jesus thought it not equality or robbery to be uh, part of the Godhead, to come here and take the form of a man uh, as a bondservant, even to the point of death. This is humility, and the, the passage of Paul in, in Philippians chapter 2 begins the humiliation of Christ, and it turns around in the last portion of, of, that, of that text in chapter 2 of Philippians. It goes from the humiliation of Christ to the exaltation of Jesus. There's no other name under heaven. Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. Jesus' humiliation is uh, a powerful force uh, that was a gracious act and a gracious power that he engaged the world with that's an example for us. So when we see this verse about uh, God's people humbling themselves, we saw that personified in God's Son when Jesus came here. This idea of approaching God humbly, God's people approaching God humbly, is a key factor that influences our impact in the world. Don't just go to God making our demands as if he's a genie in a bottle. Go to God as a king with our knees bowed, humbly, recognizing his godness and recognizing his desires as better than ours and his purposes as greater than ours. And he continues, the writer here, if my people will humble themselves and pray. Well, this is sort of the whole point of our, of our devotional today, that Tipton would be a people of prayer, but not just any kind of prayer, just words that we utter into an open room. Prayer specifically designed to reach the throne room of heaven through our mediator, Jesus Christ, and that that prayer would be a prayer that's full of humility, first and foremost, seeking God's face or seeking his perspective and his desires over our own. And that is a sign of humility when we pray humbly that God's desires would become ours and that our desires would lessen or even clear away to make room for God's. His desires are better. When Tipton looks at this verse as a church corporately, 
God will do amazing things when we come corporately together and seek God's face humbly so that he will be seen in and through us in our households and in our community. Pray and seek my face. And there's another factor, a part of this verse, and turn from their wicked ways. Now, it would not go over well if a, I, as a preacher, would say, Tipton, your wickedness needs to be confessed. And while it might not go over well, I'm going to say it anyway, because this is a biblical perspective. Tipton, all the parishioners, with myself at the lead, turn from our wicked ways. When God brings conviction, it's a good and gracious and merciful thing. He's showing us areas that need to be tended to, that need to be confessed, that need to be turned from, repented of. Uh, turned away from and not pursued anymore because those things, first of all, will not bring us joy, but it won't bring God glory. So whenever we go humbly and we're praying to God, talking to the Almighty, and we're seeking His perspectives and His desires over our own, and in the midst of seeking His desires over our own, we find that our desires are not worthy to pursue. And He says, I want you to turn from that, Tipton. Corporately, when we as a church do this, we will find a communal relationship, an intimacy with Christ, with God, that we didn't have before, one area of our life at a time. And as God chips away at these areas of our lives that are not in tune with Him, and He shores them up and strengthens us in them and cleanses us from sin because we've confessed our wicked ways, whatever they may be, you will find an intimacy that causes us to make a greater impact in our households and in our community. Humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then, I love those turning words, those verses that if then, the conditional promises that God makes many times throughout Scripture, if you do this, then I will come through. Well, if we do this, then he will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sin. He will hear, heal our land. And the healing of our land, again, there's a couple of practical applications. When we look at verse 13, um, God said, when I shut up heaven and there's no rain, whenever he causes drought on purpose, as it may be a plague or a, an act of God so that he's gaining people's attention. When God does that, he said in verse 13, or when he commands locusts to devour the land, kind of like in Exodus, whenever he has locusts come and destroy everything that would be agrarian, agriculture, any food being produced by the land. When God either stops the rain or causes a locust to eat up the crops, or when he sends pestilence, anything else around the people, like his sickness or anything else. When God does that, he said in verse 13, if my people pray, practically speaking to the people of God in 2 Chronicles, God is saying to Solomon, if I'm doing these plague-like activities to get attention and people seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways and I'll heal them, I will do that. I will bring them back to health again. I will restore their land. That's what God is practically saying. I'm not going to say he's practically going to do that to the land in the United States. I think that might be overreaching a spiritual application. Practically speaking, though, he is making that promise to them there. I'm not going to go so far as to say he's going to do that to our land. What I will say can apply from this Old Testament passage that we can draw out that would be confirmed all through Paul's writing is a spiritual application that is the application of our relationship with Christ being healed. While God is not, um, he, he is powerful enough to make a healing of a land, even in our day now. That's true. I'm not going to go so far to say that. I think it would be wiser to say, spiritually speaking, a Gentile people called to his family by grace through faith. There's a spiritual application there. And verse 14 says it. Verse 14 speaks of this. Whenever we are humble and we turn from our wicked ways and we seek God, he will heal hearts. That's true. He does that. And verse 15 actually confirms that when people's hearts are healed from pride, humility, and people's hearts are healed from um, selfishness, seeking their own desires over God's face and God's desires. And when people's hearts are healed from obstinance or not turning and repenting of sin, but staying in it because you have a right to, maybe because America says you have a right to something that God never said you had a right to. When we turn in humility and we have a selflessness or a release of what our desires are to invite God's desires. And then we have a desire not to be obstinate, but to take on instruction and direction long term. When that happens, God heals not only the people who were sinful, prideful, selfish. He heals them, but he begins to sprinkle his showers of healing on others around them by their impact as Christians. In verse 15, we read this, 2 Chronicles 7, 15. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. And while God is speaking specifically about the temple, 
we do know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When a human being who is by grace through faith saved from sin, death, and hell because of Jesus' finished work of atoning on a cross for us, God communes with that person as the little temple of the Holy Spirit. And then he sets that person in the midst of other people. That, pe that person becomes a healing agent, a representative, a reflection of Christ in the lives of other people. Again, beginning in our households. And I can't stress this enough, Tipton, for our devotions today. This idea of committing to prayer, that we might be humble, that we might be selfless or de desire God's desires over our own, and that we might repent and confess of, of any wickedness he convicts us of, that heals households before anything else. It strengthens a household. And then the very first institution that God created when he created all things was the household with the headship of a man, the glad submission of a wife, and these two complementing each other to lead families. This is God's design, and that design is the first institution God created to be a physical, visible representation of the gospel. We get that note from Paul in Ephesians 5. So I say all this because we at, at Tipton... We are being called to prayer in 2022. And by being called to prayer, I sincerely mean coming to God daily with an approach that's humble, with an invitation that he puts in us, his desires over our own, and that when he does convict us of sin, we turn from it. We gladly and we, we, we turn thanking him for the opportunity to be cleansed before him, to be closer, more intimate with him. This would be God's desire of us individually at Tipton, but it is absolutely God's desire for us corporately as a church that we might make a greater impact in the uh, communities that we live in. In 2022, if we as Tipton Baptists commit to daily offering our lives as living sacrifices, we will corporately invite the Spirit of God to bring conviction of areas needing cleaned in our own lives, and He will cause and enable us to be a healing balm for our entire community, beginning with our households moving out. You will find your household becomes a focal point of desire and attraction for unbelievers or believers who are needing to be made right with the Lord. Your household that is committed to prayer and inviting God through humility and inviting His desires to be over and above your own and in inviting Him to bring conviction and gladly submitting to conviction and confessing. When that is our household, we become a greater influence on those around us. And as the church does that, again, I repeat, when we do this as Tipton, God uses churches like Tipton in mighty ways. And in one year's time, myriads of lives can be changed in places you may never see personally. But God knows because he's doing the work. So I, I think about that old quote from the old preacher that I had in college as a teacher. Nothing of eternal significance happens apart from prayer. As Dr. Falwell said that and challenged me, I turn it over and challenge you based upon the truths we find in 2 Chronicles 7. Will you be a, a church, a, a people who commits to praying every day, waking up in your morning and inviting God to cause you to have a humble heart, to invite his desires over your own and to invite him to bring conviction that would cleanse you and cause you to, to be more intimate with him and to broaden your, your confidence in him, therefore bringing a, a confident joy in your life and bringing glory to God by your pursuits and your regular activities through the weeks. So this is our devotion this, this week. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you go back into some of the other passages we know about uh, humility, like I mentioned in Philippians 2. Uh, go into uh, Romans chapter 12 and see uh, what living sacrifices actually mean. Uh, Paul spoke about that there. Uh, spend some time in the Word about, uh, in passages about prayer. Um, I encourage you to stay in the Word this week. I look forward to coming next week with the passage I was going to preach this morning in Hebrews 2. I hope you come and invite a friend or two to come. It's a, it's a step away from the Advent meditations that we've had. That's the Hebrews 2 passage I'll be preaching on next week. So please come, invite your friends. It's, it's a good transition into a new year. It's called drifting in the new year. And I highly encourage you to make it next week if you can and uh, bring a friend with you. Uh, so until next week, as I always say, God bless and stay in the Word. Bye.